we've been in Proverbs. Cal did a good job of setting it up, getting into chapter 1. Dr. Varner took us into Proverbs chapter 2. And you get this gist, right, that this is a dad who loves his child. He wants his child to experience life to its fullest. Uh, he wants that life to be blessed in connection with God, and uh, uh, he's giving kind of safeguards like, son, please, the book of Proverbs is this, I just don't want you to mess up your life. As a parent, you've probably said that, right? Like, your prayer is, God, please don't let my, my kid experience these, um, these terrible things that life can throw at it. I want them to experience your peace. Uh, it, it's this book of, of literally fatherly wisdom of like, hey, I've taken some missteps. I want to tell you, don't, don't go down this path. Uh, this book has something for all of us, and it reminds me of uh, a rejuvenated father who's focused, and that's kind of how I feel today. Like, I feel focused. I'm like, I care about you, and so I have some things um, that, that I, I want to I want to share, and some of it is going to, I think, connect with where you are deeply. So um, here we are as a family, right? We are gathered in this space, and you have stuff going on in your life. Uh, just below the surface, you have stuff going on in your life. You painted up good, so to speak. Like emotionally, you put yourself together this morning. Some of you even put like physical stuff on your face to, to look like you got it going a little bit better. But we know this, under the surface, there is stuff going on we don't see, and this is just where you should be. Uh, so on vacation, our plan was this. We were going to go um, to Lake Lure, and um, Liz planned this great time, and we're going to spend a lot of time in the water. She rented a pontoon boat so that we could really be out there a lot, and uh, we were really excited about that. And so we're out. We're, our plan is park the boat throw down anchor, jump in the water, and play a lot. That was our goal. That was like the one thing we wanted to do. Um, it rained a lot, but in a couple of the chances we did have to go out, uh, we went out, we parked the pontoon, we opened up the little gate, got on the front, and trying to coax our children into the water. Um, so he, there's a lot of lakes here in Florida. I don't know if you've noticed that. And I kind of thought, uh, as Liz was planning this vacation, like, why are we leaving one lake to go to another lake? She answered that in one word. Very good. Gators. She's like, I don't want to get in the water where there are gators. And so I thought, oh, okay, that's wonderful. Uh, let's go up. We will go up to North Carolina. I think because she has more confidence, our children will have more confidence. Uh, but Lila, who is now seven years old, she was a little bit taller when in that picture, um, she used to be fearless. Uh, she used to be the child I thought um, someday we'd be catch her like jumping off of a building or something crazy with the parachute. Um, but something happened as she's gotten older. Something happens as we get older. Um, we have experiences. Things happen to us and we are we are less prone to taking risk. And do you know why? Because things happen that hurt us, and we gain experience, and so we're more cautious. Uh, so I thought, I was certain of this, that we were going to get on this pontoon boat, she was going to step onto the edge, and she was going to be the first one to cannonball into the water. But she wasn't. She was, she, she wouldn't, she wouldn't just like outright say it, but she was terrified. She was scared to death. Do you know why she was scared to death? She didn't know what was in the water. She couldn't see below the surface. She didn't know if she could trust what was in there. Sure, mom says there's no gators, but what else might there be, right? And so she didn't know whether she could trust what was before her. Uh, just below the surface, you can't see. She kept on asking, can we go somewhere I can see the, the bottom? Because she thinks if she can at least see the bottom, it's safer there. Interesting, isn't it? I think that's exactly how we are. We have experiences that have made us more cautious, we have things going on in life, and uh, quite frankly, as we look at the kind of the landscape before us, we can't see what's 
down a little bit deeper. And so we struggle to trust. God, how do I know this is really going to work out? I keep hearing these religious people say things like, it's going to work out. But my life experience is full of bruises and being banged up and hurt. How do I know I can trust? And I think the writer of Proverbs, this daddy, is looking at his son and he wants to say, I know life is going to bang you up. But if there's one thing, if there's one thing I could give you, it would be this. No matter what happens, trust the Lord with all of your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge God. In all of your ways, put him first and he is going to make your path straight. Um, That's Proverbs chapter 3, verses 4, 5, and and 6, right? That we know, we probably have memorized that verse. Here's my question, though. You ready for it? Do you actually believe that? I know you believe it. I, I mean, I know you believe, yeah, it's true. It's what the Bible says. Yeah, I aspirationally believe that. I trust in the Lord with all of my heart. But do you really Do you really trust God with all of your heart? Uh, In the Old Testament, really, frankly, most of the Bible, when um, talking about your heart, it doesn't mean the organ in your chest that's pumping blood through your system. Uh, It's not just talking about this muscle that that, uh, you have to have to live. It's talking about the 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 seat of your whole being your soul it's it's talking about your mind heart your body it's the all-encompassing you it's that thing that makes you not only like naturally alive but like alive trust in the lord with all of that now let me ask you if if you're to look at all of you every part of you and you were to examine it, you were to take a step back and, and maybe have a quiet space, which is hard for us, um, but to ask, okay, in my, in my mind, do I really trust God? Like, the way I think, what I think about, the philosophies, the feelings, the perspectives, do, do I trust God? How about this one? My finances and how I spend money, they, they show that I really trust God. Um, we're going to get into this in a moment, but um, the reality is I think this may be one of those places that most indicates whether or not we are wholeheartedly in trust with God. Because I don't know about you, but life costs money things happen, and, and, and in, in my world, it's how do I always make sure that I'm ahead of the curve, and I'm in charge, and I have this under control. Do you know what Proverbs says is the hardest part of trust? You ready for this? Self-sufficiency. The hardest part about living a life that's wholly in trust with God is how much control we can personally exercise over our own life. How how much control we take. We've been hurt. Things have happened in our life. Um, Circumstances don't go the way we plan. Let's just be honest. And so we get a little bit more skeptical. Even though we have some sort of physical, spiritual, emotional, sometimes even financial life vest on, we're afraid to jump in the water. We are. We're we're afraid to take that plunge because we don't know what's going to happen if we do. And we live in our, our lives in kind of a state of distrust in God and elevated trust in self. I'm going to protect myself. I'm going to guard myself. I'm not going to put myself in in places where I might be hurt. I'm not going to be faithful in giving because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm not going to put myself out there relationally because those people can be so mean. When we live our lives like that, we we technically begin to live our life in self-sufficiency instead of trust in God's sufficiency protection, covering, 
And this daddy, this daddy writing to his son, he says, if there's this one thing I want you to get, it would be that you would live your life in, in a wholehearted abandon, a surrender, a giving it all up, all the chips shoved into the middle of the table, all in, no holding back, no cashing out early. I, I'm on the whole ride, Lord, whatever it costs, I want that. It's tough though, isn't it? I, I, I don't want to just come and pretend that, hey, you get this part right and life's easy because um, there's a big question. The que- uh, t- really two, why is this so important and how in the heck would one do this? Why is this so important? Because living life in this abandoned, surrendered, all in way with God will bring you a peace that surpasses understanding. It will bring you a life of deep joy, not just surface level happiness. It will bring you things that, that really are, are intangibles in life. And I think God wants us to experience in deeper ways. The question then becomes how? I want to give you as quickly as I can, and I'm trying to read the clock so that I'm responsible with time. You got it for me? What is it? What do we got? It's 11.42. How about you give me 10 minutes, and I will give you five how-tos about putting all of our trust in God. Uh, And I'm going to grab my notes so that I'm quicker with time. Because if I don't have my notes, well, I'm going to ramble. So, all right, number one, write this down. How do I practice a life of all in, full abandon? God, I trust you. Uh, number one, it starts with every single day you have to remind yourself of God's unconditional love. That's the starting point. It doesn't start with you. It can't start with you. You can't be the source of your own energy, your own strength. It has to start with this relationship with God, this knowledge that God is there and he's good, but it takes practice of reminding ourselves that God is good because we keep on experiencing things in this world that are tough and difficult and frustrating. And so we have to remind ourselves uh, not to put our hope in ourselves or in things here or idols we create. Um, this is what three, uh, Proverbs 3, 3 through 5 says, Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them. I love that. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Uh, here is something we've been talking about for a while. Spiritual practices. I don't know if you've tried this yet. I don't know if you're drinking the Kool-Aid and trying it out, but here's the deal. I believe spiritual practices will transform your relationship with God. They're hard. They're difficult. It is a practice for a reason. We say practice it because you're not going to do it perfectly, but I believe this. With everything that's in me, I believe this. If you will begin to meditate on and write down, and record, and journal, and think about, take notes of journaling, it's too girly, Um, take notes about how God is providing, answering prayers, how God has showed up, how you can trust him, I believe you will begin to comprehend and trust that he's as good as he says he is. Um, I heard somebody say this not long ago, Uh, it's in your your, um, quiet times that you begin to understand, it's when you begin to get relaxed and there's nothing going on that you finally recognize what your idols truly are. Because we're so busy, so much is going on in our world, we're chasing so many things from one appointment to the next, from uh, one ding to the next. We live in such a fashion, but when we pull away, we begin to recognize what the true affections of our heart for, are, are for. Um, I heard this, and then on vacation, um, we went up to the mountains, and our cell service was terrible. Oh, by the way, this, I think this is funny. Uh, it just shows how messed up I am. Do you know what the first question I asked Liz was when we got to the, the cabin we were staying in? Is there Wi-Fi? 
Yes, that's how messed up I am. I wasn't sure I could make it 10 days or so without Wi-Fi. I'm just telling you how messed up I am. That's end of story. So anyway, uh, we started taking some time to, to defrag and to meditate, and I started recognizing something. When I'd wake up in the morning, there were thoughts that would come to my mind, and when we had free time, there were things I was thinking about, and I started recognizing there are idols in my life that I thought were dead a long time ago that are actually still there, and I just buried them. Because when I would wake up, I would think. I would be drawn to. Uh, I'm just, forgive me, I hope this doesn't like shatter your beliefs about me. But I didn't necessarily just wake up and think, oh good, now I get to go spend time with God. And it's going to be so wonderful and quiet and peaceful. That's not, that's not just how I woke up. I woke up thinking about other things. And wanting to go and do other things. Okay, so one real-time example. Um, you probably don't follow things like the NBA. I love basketball. Um, I haven't really followed the NBA playoffs in 10 years or so, um, not, since, um, not since a team that I really liked was really good, and they've been really bad for a really long time, so I, I really haven't cared. Um, but because I had free time, I started watching the NBA playoffs. And after watching one game, you can ask my wife, my whole life began to revolve around making sure I could watch the game. And I, I knew this. You know what I thought to myself? That's really silly. That's, that's not very, like, how old am I? 18? Like, what, what is going on here? That's what I thought. But I kept on thinking about it, and then I suddenly found myself scrolling, because we had Wi-Fi, scrolling to learn more about the players on the team and people and stuff I hadn't done um, in a very long time because I don't have time to do it, but I started recognizing something. I have idols, idols that had laid dormant that I thought were dead but were there, and um, I I have to cautiously put those things where they belong. Uh, not to say basketball is bad. I watched every game of the NBA playoffs. Uh, but I tried to reprioritize that where it really belonged. What in your life is taking precedence, priority, whether it's relationship or sensuality or uh, whether it be greed or wealth or position or power, whether it be dominating or keeping control in a particular given circumstance, God may be saying to you, give it all over to me. Trust me, you don't need to be in control of this moment. Every day you have to remind yourself of God's love. And so that leads to this. Number two, submit your whole self to Scripture. Uh, this is what the writer, this dad says, lean not on your own understanding. Why does he have to say that? Because your starting point is to think you are right. Should I say that again? Your natural starting spot, no matter who you are, is to think you are correct. Should I say that a third time just to make sure? Every single one of us, we start with an assumption that my perspective, my vantage point, what I have learned, what I have experienced, it's correct. And other people must be starting from a wrong vantage point. And so, here's what this loving father says. Don't lean on your own understanding, on your own experience, what you've learned. In all your ways, acknowledge him. Who? God and he will make your path straight. He will straighten you out. He will help take you in the direction that you need to go. Uh, by the way, if you take a look at these first 12 verses, there's an interesting pattern that you see emerging right now. Every odd verse is your responsibility as a person. My son, if you'll do this, if you will practice this if you will go in this direction the even verse response is and god will respond to you this is how god will show up it's a couplet your responsibilities here god's responsibilities here but it starts with your responsibility but what's your first responsibility 
to meditate and remember God, to put his ways around your neck, write them on the tablet of your heart, to be focused on him. So the starting point is him, and then we begin to submit to his ways, writing his word on our heart. And then the third thing is this, he says this, do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your soul. You have to learn to be humble. Uh, humility is understanding our own limitations. It is accepting that we aren't always right, that we don't always have the right vantage point, that we need to lower ourselves and allow God to speak into our life. And, and humility means fearing the Lord, God's direction, God's boundaries, God's ways. It means shunning the things that are evil, the things that lead us down a path into a direction that is is self-sufficient or is selfish. He doesn't want us going down those places. And he says in response, if you do this, you're going to experience health in your body and nourishment to your bones. Uh, I don't know if that is a tangible or just a tangible promise or if that's just a a sign of wisdom. You do this and your life is going to be rich and full. You're going to experience God's presence in new ways. You want that. Uh, Then he gets to the difficult stuff, let's be honest. As if not being selfish and self-centered, as if that's not hard, um, he targets it a little bit deeper by looking at greed. Uh, I know there is not a single greedy person in this room. I want to start there. Positive, right? There's not a greedy person in this room. But the Lord says this, uh, this dad says this in verse 9, Honor the Lord with your wealth. You're saying, good, I'm not wealthy. This does not apply to me, right? You're not wealthy. Um, You already know what I'm going to say, don't you? There's not a soul in this room that is not wealthy. Uh, I could ask Mike and Heather to come up and, and take the rest of the time to explain to you why you are wealthy. We're not going to do that. Uh, I'm simply going to say, friends, we are wealthy. The poorest person in this room is wealthy. We are wealthy. Uh, so, you have no excuse. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. You say, oh good, second out. I don't have crops. I'm not a farmer. Um, Sorry, that doesn't work either because again, the idea here is simply, you have all of these things God has given you in your life to manage and to grow. You, You have this job. You have these relationships. You have these things that you are developing, and hopefully they're growing. There are, of course, seasons, but here's the deal. You are responsible for managing all that you've been given. You've been given. So give the first fruits of your crop. Give. Do you know what that means? It means to give the first portion, the first thing that comes in, the first penny out, out of the, out of, uh, the first penny out of the first ten cents that comes in. You're giving a percentage. Ten percent is what the Old Testament set up, and what Jesus then affirms: give consistently your first and your best to God. Why? This isn't about your money. This is about keeping God first. This is about making sure that your focus is remaining on the Lord. And so he says, be generous, be generous, and then your barns will be filled to overflowing and your vats will brim over with new wine. Uh, Oh, we could just dive into that. For the sake of time, we can't. But I think the principle here is be generous with all your uh, possessions and passionate, passionate about justice. What does justice have to do with giving your first fruits? Uh, the idea was this, is that you would give your best to God first so that then the needs of the poor and the outcast and the people who needed would be provided because they had, uh, it was our responsibility to take care of culture. So we give so that others can be cared for and it brings justice. And uh, I won't even go into all the other implications of Christians being givers, caring for the needs of other people, meeting their needs. I, I, I won't go into that now, but we could. 
But finally, this. He says this in verse 11, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the son he delights in. The difficult things that you're going through, this is God's way of refining you. This is God's way of wanting to show up in your life and to prove that he is able and capable the difficult things that you're, you're going through are ways to learn about God's sufficiency and provision. It may not feel like it in the moment. I could tell story after story, and so could you, of the times where it felt like um, life was just so difficult. And that it would be easier to give up or move on or whatever you wanted to say, but... I have watched the Lord do so much through those difficult times. So if you're in the midst of that, don't give up. Uh, So Lila, on the edge of that pontoon boat, was having a hard time trusting because she didn't know what lied below, laid below the surface. She had a hard time trusting that dad's word was just safe and good and that she was going to survive. She was certain that some sea creature was going to come up from the bottom and entangle her and pull her under. As a matter of fact, one time when she finally did jump, her foot touched the bottom and she felt the slimy algae at the bottom and she was certain that something had her foot. I think that's exactly what life is like. I think that's what trust is like. Um, I will forever, well, at least for a long time, have etched in my mind this vacation with our daughters and us trying to coax them to jump into the water for the first time that day. Interesting thing happened. Who do you think the first person in the water was? The interesting thing was the first person in the water was our four-year-old Lexi. Do you know why? She hasn't been dinged up as much. I I haven't let her down as much as I've let Lila down at seven. And so when dad said, get in the water, she got in the water. But with Lila, do you know what had to happen? I had to jump in. I had to jump in the water. It was cold. It was really cold. It was really uncomfortable. I got to be honest. But I had to go first. And do you know the good news of the gospel? That Jesus jumped in to our swamp and our mess, whether there were gators or junk. He spread out his arms and he says, trust me, come to me. I don't know what you're going through, but right now I think that is an image I want you to have in your mind, that the Lord Jesus humbled himself, jumped into the mess and became uncomfortable and died, that we might experience peace that transcends all understanding. He is the perfect son of Proverbs. There is no other person who is the perfect son of Proverbs, but Jesus is. He was faithful and obedient and did all the Father said so that we could experience relationship with God. That's the good news.